But we are recording this, um, so that will be available afterwards. We'll email you all with the link to the video. Um, great. So first of all, thank you to all the panelists for joining. We, we really appreciate your time. And we're also quite excited that it's such a diverse range of experiences. Um, Tyanne, do you want to do a brief intro? Yes, absolutely. So after I say the name, um, ladies, if you wouldn't mind saying hello, so that for on our recorded screen, you come up on the screen and we can see your face because it only shows whoever's talking. Um, so first we have Vanessa Glossop, the Communications Director at Anytime Booking. Hello, glad to be here. And then Emma Johnson, UK and Ireland, Ireland Director of Yonder. Hi. Heather Bayer, the CEO of Cottage Link Rental Management. Hi from Ontario, Canada. <laughs> and Jessa Brown, the Community Manager at Outdoorsy. Hello, hello. Thank you, ladies. And I am Tyann Marsink with Touch Day, the Community Ambassador. And we have Andy McNulty, the CEO and co-founder of Touch Day. That's me. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Tyane. That's great. So uh, let's crack on. Um, this webinar was inspired by a customer of ours who had written in and said that, uh, by the way, she's got a, a huge 70,000 acre old fashioned sheep ranch in Australia, which has a campsite and lots of lodges, etc. And her comment to us was that many of her guests arrive without any food and have no idea that the nearest place to get food is a long way away. Um, I don't know what they expected, but clearly they expected the normal things that surrounded them in city life or wherever they came from. Um, but it's really hard, it was at least really hard for Michelle, the owner of the ranch, to convey all of that information to guests in like the usual text format. So she's figured out a way of doing it now. But it was that idea that there are guests that still turn up without any clue what is not there. And um, that kind of led us to think, well, there must be in the context of the last 18 months of pandemic, a lot of guests that are flipping over to different forms of accommodation, campsites, glamping, RVs, that kind of stuff, but also the more traditional vacation rental sector. And um, I wanna sort of come to you first, Jessa, if that's okay, because uh, there's been a lot of talk in the press about the attention that the RV world is getting and it's seen as this kind of new sort of form of accommodation that's exciting and but it's been around for years uh, but is, is that the reality uh, is the buzz really turning have you noticed a huge uptick in the number of guests coming to RVs yeah the RV renaissance is definitely real um, you know Outdoorsy was founded in 2015. So we just hit our sixth year anniversary now. Um, about 44% of our all time bookings took place just in 2020 alone. And about 90% of those were all first time renters. So lots and lots of people getting out and taking a road trip for the first time, at least in, a, in an RV or a travel trailer. Um, one of the things that we did after seeing this big boom um, was we commissioned a survey because we wanted to know more um, how the, the pandemic impacted people's travel plans and was 2020 truly like the year of the road trip. Uh, about 81% of the people we polled reported that be specifically because of the pandemic, they felt forced to find alternative places to travel like national parks, things, places with a lot of social dis distancing available to them outside and alternative forms of travel compared to their usual routine of booking flights, booking hotels, going to attractions, and taking a flight home. Uh, so absolutely, yeah, we, we saw a massive uh, resurgence of RV travel, and the majority of our clients last year were first-time renters and first-time RV operators. Very interesting. So the buzz is most certainly real, which brings with it a whole heap of complications when you're talking about a whole influx of new guests, but we'll come on to that in a second. I'm wondering, is it a UK, is it a US thing or is it a UK thing as well? So Vanessa, I know you're not um, an operator of RVs, et cetera, but your anytime booking is a management system that catered first and foremost, I know you're switching a bit now, but catered first and foremost to glamping and camping. So 
do you are you hearing from your customers that what Jessa described is also going on in the UK? Second, whilst the tractor goes by, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah, well. absolutely. Um, motorhome hire or RV hire, as as you're referring to it, is definitely on the increase. It's one of our fastest growing vertical markets. Um, more and more people are taking to the road, um, looking for a new adventure, driven into looking for new, you know, new holidays and new, new experiences. Um, and definitely, I mean, we, I, I have some direct feedback from um, one of our motorhome hire um, businesses who says that the last sort of 12 months has been filled with fear, fun and folly, were, was his quote. Um, a really mixed bag. He said that motorhome hire is um, a new venture for most of his customers in the last 12 months, and most have been a younger demographic, but also a wealthy one. So he feels like everyone displaced from their usual holiday who would go to a resort or, or something expensive, a villa in, in Mallorca or something, may well be transferring that spend to motorhome hire. Um, and he says one of his key um, sort of observations has been um, the, the genuine shock from city people, he says, at how friendly country and coastline folk are, um, that they're, they're overwhelmed by the reception and the warmth um, and struck by the openness that they, they receive all around the, the countryside in the UK. Um, but with it has come the problem whereby there aren't enough spaces for these motorhomes to fill. I think there's, it's just, you know, everyone is 20% busier than they, they previously were. And finding those campsites and those places to stay has become a real headache um, and a real issue for, for people most um, hiring motor homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting, there's a perception, I don't know whether it was intended to sound that way, but it's a perception that country folk somehow aren't going to be very friendly or welcoming. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's... it's I, think, I think it was more that maybe they don't have that sort of reception in the city. I don't know. Probably. That's probably it's a reflection. It was, it was and, and for some people, they absolutely loved the experience and others, I think he said they found, some found it too much, too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, you, you can't be everything to all people. Yeah, so. I completely, completely agree. I wonder, Emma, I know Yonder is in the early stage, like you've just launched in the UK. We have, yeah. Um, so even though you don't have like the historical benchmark of what we're guests searching for, I would imagine though, nonetheless, given what Yonder is, that you see this very much as a strength that there are. Very much so. I mean, what, what we're hearing is people really want to escape from towns and cities and they just want more remoteness. And with that, they want the, the sort of country experience and the rural experience um, and even just the outdoor experience. Uh, we're seeing people just wanting to walk more, cycle more, just get out and about more, which is which is what we're about. We're not just about the accommodation side. We want to be able to offer that full guest experience and, and link with people who can offer that in local areas too. So. Um, but certainly demand for rural accommodation is um, is very high now and people are looking to holiday slightly differently. So mm. it's an exciting time for us at Yonder, mm. definitely. Do you think the people who, like Vanessa mentioned it, I, I, I might have gone to Mallorca, but because I can't travel, I'm going somewhere in the UK. Definitely. Ne next year, though, am I desperate to go to Mallorca or am I like, do, do, do you think there's a fear with kind of the more domestic operators that they're going to lose a lot of demand? Yeah, I think it's going to take some time, but I also think people are exploring the UK like they've never explored before and I actually realise there's so much here. And now with social media, media, people are sort of chatting about where they've been and people are like, I, I want to go and do that. I want to go and I want to go and experience that. I want to visit there. And it's so close. So I think I think the overseas holidays will obviously always be there, but I think they'll they'll also tap a UK holiday in more and more and, it, and go with these experiences. Yeah, I, I think it's a brilliant opportunity because I think inevitably, of course, there's going to be some demand leakage as people return to their old ways. But um, the net gain is going to be there. Um, yeah, because absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, Heather, so like you, you, the, the, the cottage business in, in Ontario has been strong for, for donkey's years. I mean, it's not like a new form of accommodation. But I bet because you're so close to Toronto, you're still getting lots of the newbies. And have you noticed that this year? Yeah, exactly. I mean, just like Emma said, you know, people are finding that, I mean, our borders have been shut for um, 18 months. 
So, and they're still shut and we have no clue when this is gonna open again. So we do have this domestic market out of Toronto and Ottawa, um, but we have gained massively in the last two years. And just like Emma said, people are suddenly finding they've got a paradise in their own backyard that they never knew existed. I mean, you only have to go two hours north of Toronto and you're in this area of, of lakes and just water everywhere, everywhere you look. And we're hearing this from these guests that I never knew it was so close. Mm. And because people can't travel, we have this captive market. So business has grown massively. We've taken on new properties. We currently have nearly 800 families on a waiting list. Wow. For wow. some summer vacations. So every new, it, it, usually it's 10 minutes by the time between posting a new listing on our website to having the first booking. Huh. So it's, yes, just crazy. And, and so many, and they are all just about all first timers because there's nowhere else for them to go. So as to, to come back to what you were saying earlier, Andy, the, you know, is, is this going to be sustainable? Will it, will it carry on into 2022? I think there's a really good chance that those people have, who have found that it's cheaper and it's quicker to holiday in their own backyard are going to continue to do so, certainly mm. for, the, for the next year or two. Mm. And this isn't a question, of, this isn't a discussion about dynamic pricing, but do, are you using that? Are you trying to sell weeks at a much higher rate than you were before because of the demand? Well, we look at, uh, you know, weeks that were booked way back in September, October, we're actively joyous about cancellations that our owners yeah. are, if we get a cancellation, because prices have gone up nearly 25, 30% since last year, uh, just across the board. So if we get a cancellation, then, because we are 100% booked, mm. but if we get a cancellation, that we're actively looking at, at the market and the prices, and yes, mm. it is... Mm. Um, it's a different, it's certainly a different market this year for sure. Mm. Okay, good. So that's a bit of the scene setting, but, but of course it, you've all confirmed that there are these new guests coming. Um, uh, I, I'm going to stay with you, Heather, um, because I know from speaking to you before that, that cottage country has its own peculiarities in terms of things that you wouldn't, ex well, you ought to expect you'll find there, but city folk tend not to. Um, and so therefore you've had years of dealing with those kind of first timer problems. It, what, what kind of lessons have you taken from that historical knowledge of first timers getting stuff wrong to apply to this new kind of breed, this, this extra that you've got in the last year? Um, it, it, it's all education. You know, we're teaching about things like septic systems, um, how to manage garbage. You know, when people have been in condos for years and all they do is go to, you know, a, a communal emptying spot and just put their garbage down a chute and then find that they have to take it separate it and take it to a dump and meet the bears. Um, it's really important that we, do ed we educate them, but we've always done this. But now we're fine. Now we're looking at different ways of education because we always say, and I'm sure it's the same with everybody here, regardless of, of what travel sector you're in, people don't tend to read. So we are looking at different ways, using video, using audio, um, using text. Text has just revolutionized something we're doing, you know, how we communicate with our guests this summer so far. Um, so yeah, it, it's just delivering information in different ways. Um, mm. that, that's something we're doing that's really, really new. Mm. And I'm interested in the audio. So do you mean like devices in the home that are responding to questions or do you mean something else? Um, just, just recording something that they can listen to. You know, okay. having a recording they can listen to or, you know, using audio on on the website because, there's, there's, yeah, you know, I, I, I have a podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm well into audio. So that's something I'm looking at at the moment. It's just having audio clips that go into our, our touch day guides, which tell people how to separate garbage. So maybe they won't look at a video. They might not read it, but they might click on an audio. I think that's really smart. I hadn't ever considered that before, but like a short segment, audio mm -hmm. segment. Hi, I'm Heather. I'm going to tell you how to deal with those yeah. bears as you oh, do I'm it. Gonna do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Thank you, Heather. Jessa, this must just be the bane of your life, dealing with people coming to try and drive off, uh, I don't know what, like a 30 foot rig or something <laughs> with septic systems and all that jazz. I mean, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so um, the motorhome or RV travel, it comes with a lot of unique challenges. Um, a lot of folks refer to us as the Airbnb of RVs. And I always say, you know, I wish People know how to use a house. They can punch the numbers into the keypad. They know how to use a kitchen. Uh, with an RV, you've got a septic system on board, basically with a black water tank. You've got energy management. You've got waste management. You've got water management. Um, it's a hotel on wheels and there's a lot to learn um, if you've never used an RV before. And as the marketplace facilitator between these private owners and renters, it's really our job to make sure that they're equipped for success when they depart on a trip. We don't sugarcoat anything. Um, that's one of the things that I really love about Outdoorsy is we know things can happen on the road and they might happen on the road. Um, if you've ever driven a car, you know this, you get a flat tire. Um, so we really work hard on educating renters and giving them resources through a really robust YouTube series we filmed with RV owners that list their RVs on Outdoorsy. And then for owners, that's really our, our secret key is if we've got an owner who is intimately familiar with their RV and gives a really great orientation and then supplemental guides or documents for that renter while they're on the road, we see the greatest success in terms of trip experience, a reduction in claims or damages because they have reference material to know how to correctly operate that RV. And they have the correct expectations that you might get a flat tire, call roadside assistance, kick back and relax, and we'll come and help you out. And then we'll get, get you back on the road as soon as possible. Um, one of the things we've done for our RV owners is we launched a listing coach program uh, in October of last year. And what that is, is a free one-on-one -on -one session with an outdoorsy specialist. And they'll walk the owner through all of the best practices that we've aggregated over the last six years from dialing in their listing for conversion, which hasn't been a problem for us. Uh, yeah. We're more, more focused on supply acquisition, thankfully. Um, how to use their dashboard, responding to clients as quickly as possible and setting up that SMS tech system so they can get to their inbox as quickly as possible um, and really um, encouraging them to make sure that their key exchange is robust, that expectations are set properly and that that renter leaves their driveway with all of the resources that they possibly need to ensure that they have a great trip. So in a, in a sense, even though you're a marketplace, you don't kind of like wash your hands of the process and say, kind of, we're just putting you together. Um, I guess the future of the success of the marketplace is, is determined by, you know, the success of the renter experience. Yep. Um, one of my favorite sayings uh, to our, our RV owners is when you move, we move. Without our supply, we don't have a marketplace. And without renters renting that supply, we don't have a marketplace. So we are very much more than just a payment processor and an insurance provider. Um, we're, we're out in the field in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we run 50 in-person meetups to go out into the field, meet our clients where they are outdoors and have those conversations and make sure that we are really dialed into our community and we're listening to them about the tools that they need to make sure that their small businesses are successful. And then we go back and build that. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you. So it, it, it's, it, it so far, at least I'm getting that there are many different ways that you're communicating. Both you and Heather have spoken about, you know, video and audio and SMS and that kind of stuff. Um, Tyan, I think you have a certain experience, don't you, with your own vacation rentals. And it's not just about the method of delivery, but the way in which you say things. I think you were saying earlier, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've we been hosting for well over a decade. And I always, in my direction, said, your security code is this in our emails. Well, then I started having folks who were first time um, travelers to vacation rentals get confused. Mm. And they kept messaging and said, how do we get into the door? And I realized it was just one simple word difference. They were looking for door code versus security code. So listening to my guests and finding what issues are, it's just a simple word change um, has really helped. Mm. 
Cool. Okay. And I do have another poll to launch, um, which is on the subject of guests needing handholding or being more needy this year. Um, so I'm launching that poll and I'll leave it up for a couple minutes for folks to answer. Um, while people are answering that, um, I just wanted to continue that marketplace discussion with you, Emma, um, because Yonder effectively is that. Um, and being new uh, in, in, in um, almost launching, well, you have launched in the UK, uh, are you thinking along those lines of what Jess has done or is it a bit earlier? You're more kind of trying to get acquisition and properties onto your platform than thinking about how to talk about education, et cetera. Yeah, so a little bit of everything. Obviously, acquisition is really important to us right now. Um, but we are trying to encourage certainly the, the digital touch day um, facility so that we have got less guest interaction. Some guests want to be greeted. And I think it's, it's really important for owners and we, we try and encourage our owners to be conscious of the whole guest experience from the start. So when a guest arrive, if you are in a position to meet them, just being conscious of whether they actually want to be met, whether they want to go through things in the property or whether they just want to be left to go and put a cup of tea on or whatever, because that's very British, um, <laughs> but, and just settle in. And you can, you can generally gauge that when they arrive. Most people can, and um, certainly hosts who are, we call them stewards. Um, so stewards who are hosting guests into their accommodation can generally gauge um, whether they want those discussions but certainly I think the the digital um, manuals are, are the way forward to give that flexibility and they can be sent ahead of time um, and they're obviously cleaner they're COVID safe um, and you can adapt them at all times so that's something we're going to be encouraging uh, for all of our owners to be offering. Okay great. Um, Vanessa I'm wondering in the sort of the anytime booking system, do you facilitate things that will allow your customers to be able to address some of these challenges in terms of getting information to people timely, um, having stuff in the PMS that can go to other places? I'm being a bit vague about where that other stuff might yeah. go, but. Yeah, I mean, we, we I advocate three things really to help people manage guest expectation and that's communication, communication and more communication. <laughs> Um, I think it's really, you know, since since the users have complete control over how they communicate with their customers, it's really important that the information that they provide is really clear, consistent, complete, honest. So we do all we can to, to join up all the dots. So, of course, as, as, a, as a booking system provider, we... Um, you know, we drive the automation, we power the instant bookings and the confirmations, take the deposit and balance, pay, balance payments, all the core things that are, you know, that speed up customer service delivery, if you like. Um, but we've written an awful lot of customization, personalization, so that um, businesses can adopt their own voice in, in that communication delivery, which is really important. Um, and we've done various integrations so that uh, people can choose to use email marketing, text messaging, digital guidebooks. I know a good company who can do those. Um, <laughs> you know, I think all of these services need to be on offer to, to set guest expectations early on mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, meet them also when the guest is actually fulfilling their holiday. But I think, you know, we, we're more than just a booking system provider in the sense that, um, we kind of encourage people to go right back to the beginning and say, you know, you've, we've got a digital landscape now, but um, what is your website like? You know, we do have a web builder to help people. Some people can't come on board with us without a website. Um, it, that's the reality. Um, so, so we just try to encourage people to establish, grab attention and establish relationships really early on. Um, you know, develop a, a website, ransack their imagination early on. Um, how do you want the website to work? Is it to inspire them? Do, they, do you want them to read COVID policies? Uh, do you need to explain what an electrical hookup is? Do you need your guests to, to, to know how to use a composting loo? You know, there are all these things that for, for first time guests are, are, are real issues and problems. Um, so you want to break down those barriers to make them feel really comfortable early on. So you need to kind of turn everything on and turn it off and turn it back on again in, in the sense that you just reset, walk your site, 
you know, look at it through through guest eyes for the first time. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of what you say there is is right on the money because I, I the, the, the three things, communication, 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 like absolutely. Someone said to me recently that don't be scared of repeating yourself to people. Mm -hmm. uh, you think you said it once and therefore they should know it. But like I put myself in the shoes of receiving some information. I, I can sometimes be a bit goldfish like and you need to tell me two or three times. I think I'm normal, um, but guests very much are going to be like that because they leave their brain behind, don't they? What do you call it, Tyan? Vacation brain or something like that. So um, I, think, I think that's really important, that the emphasis on communication. But I like what you said about uh, ransacking the whole process and like, going back to your basics and thinking about your website again. And I think over the years, I'm, yeah, go on. Not even the website. Do all the kettles work? Do all the showers work? Does my smile work? All of it. Absolutely everything needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah. Um, Heather, how have you seen that change? Because it, tr traditional cottage rentals, um, I'm not saying that yours were ever like this, but maybe they were, where you didn't necessarily have the best amenities and um, it was kind of a bit, well, there's four walls and a roof and, mm. um, you know, but these days I suspect that you're having to adapt the stuff that you put in the cottage and therefore try and get your owners to invest a bit more because you've got guests who are expecting certain things yeah it's, it's it's a topic i've covered so many times you know how guest expectations have risen over the years and it's one we bring up with every new owner that comes on board uh we still have the i mean those, those who have invested in a property as as an as an investment vehicle i guess they get it they've they've done all their research but for those owners who are coming on board who've who've perhaps had a had a cottage for 30, 40 years, that's where, you know, we're, we're educating owners in exactly the same way as we're educating guests. So, you know, first time owner, uh, first time rental owners is as, as important as first time rental guests. So we are teaching, teaching things like, you know, what those expectations are. And the number one expectation um, this year, last year, has been having a, the best Wi-Fi you can possibly have. And, and we deal with owners who say, well, people are coming to the cottage for a vacation. They're going to sit on the water. They don't need Wi-Fi. Mm. Well, of course they do, which means you know, probably that owner is not suitable for, for this business um, because it's all about catering to those expectations of those new guests. And, you know, going back on the new guests, they've come to us from experience of hotels and resorts and um, rentals in the US where standards are, and I know I've got some Ontario uh, viewers probably on this webinar, but standards in the US are typically much higher than they are in, uh, in Ontario because we have this tradition, as you, you said it, Andy, you know, there's this more laid back tradition of, of cottage rentals. So we've had to build our standards to meet the expectations of all these, of all these new guests. And, mm. you know, that's been a challenge in itself. And I mean, Jess, they're talking about that where people want to come and they, have, they, want, they want the best Wi-Fi and they want all these mod cons and stuff. But I, I, I might be wrong in assuming, maybe it's a romantic vision of what the RV world is, but maybe some people do want to disconnect a little bit more in the RV world than they do in the more traditional cottage world. Is that true? Or are, or are those guests still demanding the things that they would expect back home? I think it's really variable. Um, we have a lot of different segmentations that are looking for different RV experiences. So we've got families that want to disconnect to reconnect with their kids. And they're looking for like a, a large fifth wheel delivered to a campsite that's going to have Wi-Fi, but probably a weak signal and something nearby to explore. Uh, we've also got a lot of millennials. Millennial travel is booming in the RV industry and they're looking for much newer current year model uh, class B rigs. So class Bs are basically a camper van with a, ba a bathroom, a shower and a toilet. And those typically have onboard Wi-Fi, uh, cell boosters and all of the bells and whistles that you could possibly imagine in a hotel room. Uh, like I said, just on wheels. So we have, um, we have everything from vintage Westphalias to brand new state-of-the-art 2021 model uh, camper vans with all the bells and whistles. 
And what we consistently see is the camper vans and the drivables typically rent at a higher rate with the millennials and boomer crowds. And then our friends, uh, families and pet lovers typically have those trailers delivered to campsites. Um, so we, we've got a little bit of everything um, on the site. That's the beauty of being a marketplace is uh, yeah. you can look for exactly what you want and probably find, um, find your perfect RV match. That's exactly what I was thinking. You, you have, I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to manage, but it's also a huge advantage that you can segment and almost pre-qualify. You know, you're this type of guest, therefore this is the sort of thing you might like, um, which isn't always possible for a lot of, um, at least our traditional customer set who have like a set of condos in Orlando or this in New York or whatever. It's, it's harder to appeal to everyone. But I would imagine in that scenario, that's where you need to make it ultra clear in your communications you know, on your website, in your listing descriptions, et cetera, that you are this kind of place. Don't come here if you want this, because we don't have this. Um, Emma, where do you, where would Yonder fall in that? Because I, I get the feeling you, you have, or at least I see it in the, in the, the material that, that I've read so far, that it's more of an escape and it's more of a reconnection with nature. So, but do you still think they all want those things that Jessa mentioned? Um, yeah, I think I, we're really, uh, keen to tap into sort of the outdoor guests who want to experience the great outdoors and um, and sort of submerse themselves into rural places and um, and just enjoy that sort of thing. So that's something we're really trying to push. And, and with that, we, um, we really want to encourage our stewards, uh, so the owners of the properties, to be um, supporting the local area as well. So rather than kind of like getting your a uh, supermarket delivery arranged before you come along. So you're leaving your townhouse and getting a supermarket delivery arranged to deliver. We, we want to encourage our stewards to encourage their guests to be making links with um, farm shops and uh, local food sources to get their food delivered locally and encourage that kind of thing. I think that's, um, I'd forgotten you and I talked about that actually in, in our pre-meeting, yeah. but it's 100% it's correct because um, so for, for, for the non-UK people we have, um, uh, I call it Ocado. That's just what Ocado is known for, is online shopping. So I have my Ocado delivered to home every week. If I go and stay somewhere else in the UK, I'm probably going to ask for my Ocado to be delivered there, almost like I haven't gone anywhere, which is yeah. a great shame. It's a great pity because I ought to know, ditch that, there's this really cool farm shop. And by the way, we can deliver certain things to you or mention us and you'll get a certain deal there. Yeah. Um, and you creating keep, uh, links like that it's so important yeah, yeah. and i mean yeah. so many places now in the, the rural areas they've really started to sell their own produce um and that that's huge now here in the uk so you can get some really really good food stuff better than what you would in in the local supermarkets i mean i tend to try and shop locally uh, as much as i possibly can so yeah 100 yeah. percent. and keep keep the, the the tourism spend in the economy in which you visited yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And something else we're really looking to drive, which we touched on in our meeting, is um, really encouraging people when they are visiting to explore by bike and by foot and um, give them the local sort of independent cafes and places to visit and that sort of thing. So that they're supporting them rather than the big chain cafes. And, um, and again, you tend to get better produce there. You're going to get a better cup of coffee and a, and a better bit of cake. So mm. uh, that's what we want to be supporting. So we want to be able to offer sort of downloadable cycle routes and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, amazing. Um, Vanessa, I have a feeling that any time's working a bit with local tourism organisations um, and regional groups to try and kind of hook a more local slant into things. Am I right or wrong in that? Yeah, we, we have a connection with um, a supplier linked with Visit Britain, um, TXGB, or the Tourism um, Exchange, Great Britain. Um, and they work on very much a regional level, working with all the local DMOs. And it's really important for us to offer our clients that choice so they can, they can try to encourage customers from, from the big guns and the international stage, Airbnb, Booking.com, and so on. Or um, we like to support the more regional approach too. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's important because just to, to echo what Emma's been saying, really, that, you know, some 
while some guests have been displaced from their usual holidays and they're, they're landing on, on home turf, I think they've many of them, probably a very high percentage of them, have fallen in love. It's sustainable. Yeah. Great, it's great news for all of us. You know, they've enjoyed the halt of planes in the skies and they've lapped up sort of the regional, regional eccentricities and that kind of thing. Mm. So I think, yeah, let's do all we can to encourage that um, and, and again offer the choice. Um, you know, we have to keep telling our clients that we do have these connections. It takes a long time for the, for the message sometimes to sort of disseminate through. Um, but yeah, it's great for us all operating in this space. And while I know that while it's good news predominantly, some first time guests will have hated the feel of the earth in between their toes and their, mm -hmm. their self catered sausage, and they can't wait to get back into the international <laughs> travel corridors. Let them go. I think, yeah, we, yeah, I'll say what, what we have for the people who want it. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, well said, well said. We can't. Who said it earlier? We can't please everyone all the time. You might have said that as well. I think I said that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Focus on what we're good at and there goes another tractor, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I want to add on what Vanessa said about uh, connecting with your local uh, Chamber of Commerces, the DMOs and things like that, especially getting those first-time travelers to your area because I and we are connected with all of well, several chamber of commerces in the area. And we frequently get phone calls from folks who have called the chamber of commerce and said, we want to come to your area. What is there to do and where do we stay? Yeah. And because we built those relationships with the chamber of commerce, they say, okay, you, these are the things you like to do. This is the type of group you're traveling with. The, these are the excellent places to stay. Um, and so having that extra connection there, I think is really important. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think by offering these experiences and things too, you're likely to extend your season and we're all looking to to build on, build out of that summer season into those shoulder seasons and even into the winter. And um, yeah, the ability to do that will will gain us more bookings in the long run. So we just got to think outside of the box a little bit and, uh, and keep this going. And uh, so all of that discussion around trying to promote to those first time visitors or even even those existing guests that, that there's an opportunity to experience a better produce locally or to shop here or to see this site um, instead of the usual things they might expect to do. And that to me is one of the most important parts of trying to promote the positives of um, what I would say all, all forms of independent accommodation, but historically it's very much been the vacation rental holiday let world to try and make a more positive story around the benefits of it, as opposed to the negative stuff you hear about people coming in and buying up our homes and pushing prices up and bringing parties and drugs, and all, which happens of course, but no more or less than anywhere else. Um, but in cottage country, Heather, do, uh, cause, because it, it has been more traditional, do, do you face that, that local community kind of backlash or are they much more willing to embrace? Do you have that same challenge when you've got new people coming oh, yeah. in? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. I mean, it, it's, it's changed massively in the last 10 years with the advent of, um, um, of Airbnb within our communities. You know, cottage rentals have been going for you know, 50 years or more. And it, it was all very much, you know, the same families came back to the same place every year and they were welcomed into the community. Um, but a couple of things have changed. One is that the, the nature of these groups have ch has, has changed dramatically. And, and also the nature of our communities, our cottage country communities has changed because they all used to be uh, second homes and usually summer cottages. But you go into some of our locations now and around some of our lakes. And, and just, just to give you an idea, you know, Ontario has 250,000 lakes we've got 20% of the world's fresh water. You know, I have 140 properties that I rent and every one of them has private waterfront. So what, um, what people used to experience and just come up to their cottages for the summer, they're all, so many of them are now being converted into full-time residences. Mm. So the lakes that used to be dotted with summer cottages are now fully populated by retirees, people who have retired to the country. Now they have, may have rented many times in the past, mm -hmm. but they have changed their attitude now, they're living there full time. And I spoke to an owner 
the other day, uh, a, a neighbor of one of our properties the other day, and he was complaining about uh, the guests next door because they, they were being a little bit um, rowdy. And, and he said, you know, these people come in every week. And he said, every week I have to contend with excited people because they're coming on vacation uh, as if there's something essentially wrong with that. And when I got into discussion with him and he said, well, you know, I used to rent years ago, but this is, this is what we're facing. You know, people move into these areas, they create the more residential communities and there is quite a lot of the not in my backyard attitude going on. And we're seeing this in townships and municipalities presenting rental bans, etc. So it comes back to education of these first time guests to let them know that they are entering a community which is comprised of many full time residents and the importance of respecting that and respecting noise ordinance and not allowing their respecting boundaries you know we have no boundaries between properties there are no fences there are no boundary lines so we have to educate these guests that they should be where these boundaries are and they shouldn't cross them and the fact that there's a there's a swim raft out in the lake does not mean it's a communal swim raft it it belongs to somebody else right. so we're, we're doing probably more in the way of education with um, with guests now because of the na- the changing nature of our communities, but but I, I hear all that. But I would imagine that those guests come um, with with that vacation brain, with that kind of I'm free for a week or two, oh, yeah. I, you know, and pay no attention to that that stuff. Do, do you see that as just inevitable? And you know, there's, there's only so much you can do. Or are there other things that you're trying to do to psychologically hit them that this is important? Well, it, it, again, it's, it's just education. And I, I did a presentation with you and Tyanne way back um, several years ago. And you had a slide, Andy, with that. It was a US um, gas station with the tumbleweed. And since then, we have created what we call the tumbleweed campaign, courtesy of Andy McNulty, <laughs> <laughs> which aims to, you know, from the moment they book to the moment they arrive, is drip feeding education, drip feeding the fact that they're, they may, they're leaving their condo in the city, but they're coming and they may only be driving an hour and a half to two hours, but they're going somewhere that's entirely different and over the course of you know, maybe four or five months, we, we, we will attempt to show them how different it is and how important it is that they, they understand the etiquette that comes with this different location. So it's back to the, the point of repetition again. Mm-hmm. It's, it's over communicate these things. Yeah. Um, Jesse, you know what's coming. You know, th- these RVs you know, pour through local towns and they come and they go. And, uh, it's very transient. Do, 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 how, how do you um, address that with your owners to make sure it's a responsible form of RV renting? Yeah, um, the RV community is really unique. We have not seen any of that pushback in our areas throughout the US. Uh, we are a global brand, but most of our international operations because of the pandemic are still kind of ramping up, uh, but the RV community is, is really warm and really welcoming. And uh, day after day, I see these RV owners who are making a significant amount of money to either offset their loan, supplement their income, or we've got many people on Outdoorsy who have made multiple millions of dollars running RV fleets. And at almost all of their cores is this really deep desire to enable people to go rediscover the outdoors and America's national parks. And what they want to do is share that experience. They also want to make money, uh, but they really want to share the experience of camping and RV travel with these renters. So we've really seen the opposite. We've seen a huge embrace of all of these new folks who want to get out to Zion, to Yellowstone, to Big Bend and rediscover the really beautiful parts of America outside of the cities. We're very lucky in the US to have a lot of open space. Uh, we've got our metros and our cities, but there's a lot of, uh, of undeveloped land here and 
the government has formed those into really massive national parks. So we've got a lot of space to breathe. The one problem I will say that um, we're running into, I think Vanessa mentioned it, is campsites are just booked out to infinity. We've got a lot of national parks that are booked out to late 2022 at this point. So um, a lot of people have gotten creative. We work with a company called Harvest Hosts. They have built out sites at wineries, distilleries, llama farms. They've got a little bit of everything all over the country as opposed to a traditional RV campsite. And then we actually just made an investment into a company called Collective Retreats. They're a boutique glamping experience um, throughout the United States. And we'll be building RV decks with them on, alongside their property. So it'll be uh, a docking station you can pull an RV into. And in the docking station deck, there's going to be a bathroom, an open air living room, a plunge pool, a soaker tub more of a luxury experience, but we are actively trying to get more campsites built because um, that's like our, our biggest bottleneck right there is so many people want to get outside. You just got to find somewhere to put them. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? How um, the boom has created this kind of new opportunity to think about delivery of the experience that you might get in an RV, but with a bit more luxury or it's a bit like yonder. I'm not saying that exact model is the same, Emma, but it's certainly this idea of there's a different space for you to enjoy the outdoors, um, reconnect with nature and local experiences and, and all that Definitely. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, really similar, yeah. Mm. Can, I, can I just add to add, add that to, to, to add to that, Andy, very quickly? Um, one thing with this sort of saturation of um, campsites in the UK, certainly, um, with regards to motorhome hire is a lot of our small CL sites or our small CS sites, um, they complain that often, you know, with people have a force to wild camp, essentially, because they don't have a long string of, of, of units to go, you know, pictures to go to in a two week holiday or whatever. So there's some wild camping taking place and then they pull up into their small CL and that's where they offload all of their grey waste and all of their rubbish and fill up on their water all over again and then cruise off for another three days while camping. So that in itself is creating a unique problem in the UK. Hmm. for some of these smaller sites they're just becoming waste grounds really for yeah. RV, rvs on the move so that's something yeah. else to consider well, what's a cl and a cs uh the small um certified sites and related okay. to camp the, the the clubs the motorhome uh camping and sorry caravan and motorhome club and um the 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 they're small they're certified they're only like five pitches for 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 touring um and yeah, they've, they're, they're encountering this problem. So they need to think up a, a way to, to spin their model to avoid yeah. being the, the, the dump ground in between stays. Yeah. Um, cool, we're almost running out of time. Tyan, was there anything else you wanted to add? I'd like to see the results of our second question. Do your guests need more hand-holding, AKA are they new this year? Yes. Go ahead and share those. 67% uh, of our attendees said yes, 24% um, same. And then we had a comment from Chuck. Um, he says, actually not so much needy as not understanding staying in a home versus a hotel. Yep. Um, hopefully Chuck, that was sort of a lot of what we spoke about. So hopefully you got something out of that. Um, uh, Interesting that there's this neediness. Um, yeah. Um, what else? Uh, James Cornwall hate tourists, even though we rely on them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> it's the same here as well. Yeah, in little pockets uh, of the area. Yeah, and I think Vanessa, you were saying that the other day it was so busy in, in Cornwall, you were just like, can can we just go back to peace and yeah. quiet? <laughs> <laughs> we need we need the tourists it's yeah. just as fact but it, yeah. it is absolutely rammed in Cornwall um yeah back to that point about hand holding though while I think technology and automation is very much part of the solution to managing guest expectation the the the, hu the need for human contact has also increased all of our users have reported an increase not only in the online bookings but 
in all of the telephone calls, you know, fact finding calls. Um, so there's a fine balance between adopting technology and making sure there's the human touch there as well. Um, that's something that the pandemic certainly taught us. And I think there's a huge opportunity, even if you are using technology to bring human touch into it, because it's, it's actually what Heather said. It's like you can put audio files in technology, you can put video, you can write copy. I think you said it with your own voice, your own brand coming across in the copy. You can be humorous, you can be direct when you need, you know, it's... Um, that kind of deliberate thinking, that unpacking that you mentioned earlier is kind of really good to do. Um, what else was I gonna say on that? I was gonna say something else, but it slipped my mind. Um, if anybody else in the audience has a question, please feel free. Um, and Tyan, I see you've put the final question. Um, yeah, I mean, we just want some honest feedback. Um, has it been useful? Has it not been useful? Uh, um, anyone else on the panel got anything to add before we kind of wind things down? Anything that you, you want to, to say based on some of the things you've heard? I just think a really big question for me is how hard is, is it going to be to really meet guest expectation this summer when the industry, certainly in the UK, is so desperately understaffed? Um, the pandemic and also Brexit. Just, you know, everywhere's having issues with, with chefs, waiting staff, reception staff, you name it. So that's really key for me to see how that pans out. So it's, it's, it's a, a steep mountain to climb for a lot of people, I think, this season. Yeah, staffing's a major issue, isn't it? Um, e even if not in our industry directly with, I know cleaning is very difficult, but even when our guests are staying here, are they getting the best experience in the local pub? Because I know they're struggling to, to get the right people working there and stuff. So it's, yeah, it all has a knock on effect. Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more. I've remembered what I was going to say. Um, it was, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, we've started the podcast and we just finished our pilot series. So we're going into season two. But one of the episodes we had was with a guy called Wes Melton, who's in the vacation rental world. And he said that he thinks operators should be trying to encourage more communication with, with them. Mm. So don't kind of want to push the guest away and not hear from them, but actually embrace and bring them back because that's your opportunity to brand yourself. That's the opportunity for them to remember you as opposed to forgetting you uh, or not having any sense of who they're staying with. Um, Heather, you must do some of that. You must do tons of that cottage world. Oh yeah, this. I mean, we, we've we've changed our practices hugely this year. Um, we've just started. Uh, we've just started using Breezeway for our text messaging. And it's, it's just made a monumental change because we have automated texts that go out um, the day before they leave on vacation, the day they arrive, the, set, the day after. And, what, and we've just found that it's creating a relationship with guests that we never had before. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd, we'd sent information out between booking and their arrival. And we were wondering, you know, are we overloading with all these texts? But in the three, four weeks we've been doing it now, we've had nothing but positive feedback. And I think we are, you know, we, we don't have enough data to, to really evaluate the effectiveness yet. But, you know, just from, from the way it seems, we're getting less in the way of, we're getting a lot more in the way of communication because they're responding to everything mm -hmm. we send out. But we're getting less in the way of angry people because there's always some, they, they know there's people out there to talk to them. And I think out of all the things that we've done, just having this very brief text messaging going out two or three times before they, before they arrive and when they arrive, giving them the opportunity to feed back to us is making a, a huge difference. Yeah, and I, I think I can speak from experience here in terms of our own business that um, our 14 day free trial period, you get emails from me. They're automated, of course, but if you reply, you get me. And a lot of people say, why on earth do you do that, Andy? Like, you, surely you're getting hundreds of replies. I'm not, I don't. We do have that many customers onboarding each month, but I don't get that many replies. The ones I do get sometimes say, oh, I love it. Or, you know, thanks very much. Oh, it's so nice to see a person. Or, and that to me says that people just want to know that they can find a person to talk to but they won't abuse it because they've got no interest in abusing it. 
there's, there's, there's no real reason to unless they have something specific they want to say. So I would say don't be afraid too much of, of embracing a little bit of making yourself more accessible. Um, good, I think we're, we're about out of time. Um, just one question that came in time there, I think at the end, do you think text is better than email? Can I answer that one, um, Andy, because we've just got this experience that I, I've, I mean, we've always emailed guests in the past, but text is so much more instant. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it, it's just um, as it happens. So somebody, when, we, when we've had half a dozen this morning talking about different things and we've been able to respond within seconds, whether it would take minutes or more to do an email. So yeah, I think text is better than email. For those people who like using text, yeah, I'm a fan of the text as well, I'd agree. And I think if, sorry to interrupt time, I think if you, if you reply with a text with a link somewhere that gives them the answer or the help, um, yeah. then I'm talking touch day now, of course, because well, you can deep link into the touch day guide, yeah. but, but it can be a word docking bit, wherever else it is that you've got a source of help. If they can go into that, then they go, oh, and there's actually other stuff here. That reduces yeah, yeah. the questions going forward. Yes. Sorry, Tyan, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to plug our next webinar. So oh, go for it. Do it. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. And our next one is July 29th. And it's how to convert your photos, video, and floor plans into bookings. And um, I'm really excited about this one because we will have a host owner over in Bali who's going to talk about how his photos help convert uh, into more bookings than those around him. And Tyann's former life is as a professional photographer. So mm -hmm. you've got the creds there as well. Um, cool. Thank you, everyone, um, both attendees, but um, as importantly, Thank you to the panel. Um, some really, really great observations there. And uh, it wouldn't have been quite the same if, if any of you hadn't been here. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um, hope the summer goes well. And um, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks. Great. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.